My name is Nicholas Christian. Uh, I was uh, the first employee at, uh, at Datacratic. Um, so uh, a little bit about Datacratic. Uh, we're a software company. We specialize in machine learning. Uh, we were founded in Montreal five years ago. Uh, we have 30 employees now. We're uh, venture funded. Um, our investors are uh, Real Ventures and uh, BDC. Um, and uh, we have a couple of products in market. Um, we've basically been using machine learning to solve customer problems uh, for, for the five years that we've been in operation. Our two products right now, if you know anything about um, uh, digital marketing, so we do real-time bidding optimization and uh, audience optimization. So we do look-alike modeling uh, for some of the biggest uh, data management platforms in the world. Um, and these two products me, are basically black boxes, right? People send us data, we send out predictions, we do machine learning uh, inside the company. Uh, and our customers don't really know much about how the models work. They don't have a whole ton of control over how the model does, does what it does. Um, and uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today is our new product, which sort of is, it turns this on its head. It's a self-hosted machine learning database. We call it MLDB. Um, and it's basically, it's basically just what it says on the box. It's a database for doing machine learning. So I'm going to get to the agenda for this talk in just a second, but first I'm going to answer the question that's on sort of half of your tongue, which is what the heck is a machine learning database? Um, I'm going to answer that question sort of by analogy. Um, so most databases that uh, everyone here is used to dealing with are basically designed to answer this kind of question. Select what happened from historical data, right? Most of the sort of big data analytic workload is counting things. How many tweets? How many dollars? How many ads? You know, group by, group by space, group by time, that sort of thing. This is basically uh, what, what this kind of system is designed to answer. Uh, MLDB is designed to answer queries like this. Select what will happen from new data. So we use machine learning, uh, or we empower users of MLDB to use machine learning to execute this kind of query. So I hope that gives a bit of a, a teaser for, for what we do. Um, so the agenda for this, uh, for this talk is, first of all, uh, I know some people here uh, already know a fair bit about machine learning, but I just want to do kind of a level set and uh, and give like a, a one slide overview of what machine learning is, um, explain to you why we built uh, a database from scratch, a Datacratic, to solve the, uh, this kind of problem, uh, cover the, the data model, uh, what kind of SQL support we have, and the REST API that MLDB exposes, um, give you an overview of what it's like to build a machine learning application with MLDB, talk to you about scaling, this is big data Montreal, we all, all want to know how big the data is, um, and then time permitting and interest permitting, if I have lost you all, uh, we won't do a demo, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to do a demo. Um, sounds good? Okay, so I've introduced myself. I'm gonna ask you guys a couple questions to get a sense of like who's in the audience. So who here uses SQL at work on a regular basis? Okay, who here uses machine learning at work on a regular basis? Okay, who here uses Docker on a regular basis at work? Okay, who here uses Hadoop on a regular basis? Awesome, cool. Um, so the answers for me, I've forgotten the order, but machine learning, yes, SQL, yes, Docker, yes, Hadoop, no. Um, so first of all, uh, what is machine learning? Super high level, machine learning is all about getting computers to program themselves. Um, the canonical example, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is spam filter. So you can sit down and write rules by hand. You know, if the message contains the word Viagra, then it's spam. Um, <laughs> um, but that gets old pretty quick, right? They invent all sorts of new drugs all the time, uh, and so you gotta kinda, kinda gotta uh, write a whole bunch of new, new rules. You know, if message contains Cialis, then it's done. Uh, so that's a whole lot worse <laughs> than just uh, using software to create those rules, right? Software can basically uh, sort of watch what you put in your spam box and what you keep in your inbox, determine the rules automatically, and if we can get software to do that, then in fact we can get it to keep the rules up to date automatically. So not only does the computer program itself sort of once, but it continues to program itself. And that's basically machine learning, right? The computer learning uh, how to solve a task for you. So what does it look like in sort of pseudocode in some unspecified language? Uh, very briefly, um, this is kind of how, how I look at it. Um, you can create an object called a trainer from an algorithm based on some kind of configuration. Uh, you can get that trainer. You can feed it a whole bunch of historical data to give you the parameters of what's called a model. These are basically the rules uh, that, say, a spam filtering engine will use. Uh, you take those parameters and feed it into uh, a, a, a function, which will basically execute those parameters. We call that a predictor. Um, and everything above this dotted line is basically what a data scientist does, right? Data scientist is very concerned uh, about, about uh, how to train a model to get the performance that you want. Below the line is basically engineering or product-related work. You take your predictor and you feed it some new data, and you get some predictions. 
So in the case of spam filtering, new data is like, here's a new email. Do we think it's spam or not? Uh, and that's the prediction. And then presumably, we take some action. So if it's a high enough probability of being spam, we stick it in the spam box. At some future date, um, the world, which in general we consider to be users, will give you some feedback on your prediction. So you get some sort of outcome. If uh, you put it in the spam box and the user retrieves it and puts it back into the inbox, well, you're probably wrong. Uh, if they leave it where it was, either they don't care or, or you were right. So generally what you would do is you would append to your historical data uh, some information so that the new data row and the outcome. And then you can do this whole loop all over again, right? You can retrain, get new parameters, get a new predictor. And in, in this way, sort of looping back and forth here, uh, you, you get an adaptive machine learning system. So this is basically, I'll, I'll refer back to this, but I kind of want to just give everyone a, uh, an overview. Does that kind of make sense for everyone? Okay. So why did Datacratic build a, a MLDB? We built a whole database from scratch. I get this question sometimes, like, did you guys really build a database? Yes. Did you build it on top of some other database? No. <laughs> well, it's not Postgres under the hood. It's not SQLite under the hood. We, we, we just created the database. Um, so why? You know, it's a, it was a fairly big undertaking. Um, the pain points that we kind of felt in a typical machine learning project are, first of all, you usually start with some data that was recorded for some other purpose, right? Someone basically says, okay, we have a whole bunch of data. It's here in this relational database, which we use to track transactions. Um, uh, please, you know, do some, do some machine learning with it. Uh, the next thing you do is you start, like, messing with it, and you bang it into some format that will fit the machine learning library that you have chosen. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, those machine learning libraries are numerical libraries, so they expect these, like, nicely aligned in-memory arrays, or they're in a programming environment which is completely different from your production environment, like R or something like that. So you spend a lot of time uh, working on this. The various surveys uh, have been done on, uh, on data, on, uh, have been posed to data scientists to ask them you know, how long they spend uh, messing around with data to get it to be just sort of the right shape. And people say they spend you know, 50% of their time uh, solving this problem, maybe 3% of their time actually doing the machine learning, so working on the sort of training predicting loop. Um, so once you actually do this, um, fairly frequently you'll realize that the model code that came out of your machine learning efforts isn't ready to go into production. You often can't take something that was trained in R or MATLAB and sort of stick in the web server and, and, uh, and, and hope to, to actually get predictions. Certainly, uh, when I was in university, I was super happy about my little spam filter that I built uh, in, in Python. I was like, okay, so how do I get into Outlook? Because I was using Outlook for my, uh, <laughs> for my email client. Uh, so you know, my model was definitely not production ready. Um, so then you basically rewrite the model code in some, uh, some production environment. Um, and the, the, the biggest pain point is that none of what you've done here is reusable for your next machine learning project. So this is, these are the problems that we were trying to solve. So Datacratic, we built MLDB to be an end-to-end -end solution to help solve problems with, the, with uh, machine learning in such a way as to be reusable and sort of avoid all this stuff, spend most of our time adding value on doing machine learning. So um, we were lucky enough when we started five years ago that we already had the production-ready machine learning code. We had um, uh, open source library called JML. The founder and CEO of Datacratic is called Jeremy. So we have Jeremy's machine learning library, JML. Um, production ready machine learning code, uniform uh, C++ API, all of the sort of functions took the same, uh, the same input. Uh, by the way, I'll be, I'll be posting a video in the slides of this talk if you guys want to you know, take pictures of the, of the slides. Um, so we had a really good algorithm coverage, we still do, uh, various uh, machine learning algorithms which I'll cover in a second. Um, so our code was good to go. Uh, but we still were spending a lot of our time uh, shuffling data back and forth, sort of cramming it into, the, into the, this uniform C++ API. So we asked ourselves, you know, if, if we knew we were going to do machine learning with the data, because that was the, the mandate of the company, to democratize access to machine learning tools, uh, how would we store our data if, if we knew that this was the target, right? I said that the, the, the starting point, the starting pain point was that you often use data that was recorded for some other purpose. Well, what if you knew that you were going to use it for machine learning? How would you store it? Uh, keeping in mind, that you want to use machine learning to model um, such data sets as user behavior, sort of user clicking around on the website doing stuff, uh, bags of words. So in general, if you look at, a, at a, an email, you look at it as sort of a collection of words. You would like to model that, model the spam probability of that. Um, and user rating is very important. If you have, uh, if you look at sort of a system like Netflix, you've got a bunch of movies, you've got a bunch of users, and users will have rated movies. So that's the, that's the kind of data that we were, working, we were intending to work with. So the requirements that we had kind of come up with based on you know, years of experience working with machine learning uh, were basically these. So one, you have to have a flexible, you have to, the, whatever storage mechanism we used had to have a flexible schema. Uh, sort of pathology, when you're learning, it means you don't already know everything ahead of time. 
So if you have a rigid schema and you already know what all the columns are, uh, you probably aren't doing a whole lot of learning because it's already fitting into some sort of structure that you've already designed. So we have to have a flexible schema. A uh, pretty simple argument for that is if you're doing something like spam filtering, um, you know, new words come up all the time, right? Someone invented some new kind of enhancement drug. Uh, you got to have a column for that because otherwise, you know, how are, how are you going to be able to learn about that? Um, the second major requirement was that you had to have a very strong notion of time in, uh, in the actual data structure itself. There's a kind of saying in machine learning, you, don't, you try your best not to use the, the future to predict the past. Uh, it's a very easy way to build a machine learning model that looks really, really great in the lab, it's got super performance, and then you put it into production and it doesn't work at all. Why? Because you gave it um, information about uh, the outcome of events as well as the input and then use that to predict what was going to happen. So it gets very good performance because it's essentially cheating. So in order to control very finely what information you, fit, you feed into a training system, uh, the actual data structure itself had to have a strong notion of time. Um, third, uh, whatever data structure we had had to have indexing built in. Uh, you often have to join outcomes to input long after the fact. So one of the first problems that, that we hit, um, and the last time someone from Datacratic was here at Big Data Montreal, we were telling you how we solved this problem, um, is basically uh, when you show online ads, often someone will purchase something up to 30 days later. And so you, you have a sort of a purchase event, and you've got to look back 30 days to figure out, you know, did I show an ad to this person? Um, without an index, that's going to be very costly, especially if you sell a lot of stuff, which is the goal. Um, and then finally, uh, matrix operations had to be cheap based on this data storage. So um, singular value decomposition is one of the algorithms we lean the most heavily on. Um, I don't have enough time to explain it here, but basically, if you have some very, very sparse data, uh, for example, you know, emails, there's lots of words, there's lots of emails, but most emails don't have most words in them. So by definition, that's sparse data. You're going to need to do some kind of dimensionality reduction. Uh, which is basically tends to be a matrix operation. So we needed to be able to do fast matrix operations. On the so we left kind of a trail of uh, dead and broken technologies behind us on our quest to, uh, to figure out what the perfect data storage system was. Uh, certainly we started with flat files like everybody else. Uh, flat files are no help, right? I mean, there's no index, uh, there's no structure. You, it's kind of the absolute basic thing you could do. So we certainly tried that to see if we, if we weren't over-engineering something, but uh, our code spent all of its time just scanning and scanning and scanning. And so, okay, so we found that. Um, we tried using HDF5, not HDFS, HDF5, uh, which is sort of a data storage um, backend for, for scientific computing. Uh, it was just too rigid, both on an API level and on a schema level. Um, we tried using SQLite for in-memory sort of uh, traditional relational. We tried using Postgres. It was okay for doing joins, but uh, it really failed on the flexible schema thing, right? We weren't able to, uh, to, to, to model our data the way we wanted to. Uh, we tried using Postgres and SQLite just by storing tuples. So instead of actually having data sets with lots of, lots of columns, we tried just storing the coordinates, sort of trying to emulate sparse storage uh, in Postgres and SQLite. Uh, that worked okay, but it was way too slow for joins. Um, and the matrix operations just didn't work out. We spent, you know, our, our software was spending most of its time sort of shuffling data in and out of Postgres rather than actually doing what we wanted to. And then finally, uh, we tried Hadoop. Um, and and uh, for joins and matrix operations, it was just way too slow and shockingly expensive. Um, the, the solution that we came up with for doing uh, joins took basically one hour on one machine, whereas for Hadoop, it took like 10 hours on 10 machines or something. So it was just uh, absolutely not going to work out for us. So the data model that we came up with at the end of the day is essentially a 3D sparse matrix. Um, we have named rows, we've got name columns, we've got timestamps, and we've got values. So you can view it as kind of this cube type thing, with time running across the side, rows uh, up and down, and then columns sort of into the, into the board here. If you slice at a particular time point, it looks a little bit like a normal table. You've got columns, you've got rows, and you have values. And you see that in this particular case, at this particular time point, I've only got two values, right? So it's very sparse. Um, and an alternative view of this type of data is essentially an event lock, where you have sort of values that come in. So here at a particular time, you've got a row name called user123, a column called first name, and this person's name is Bob. You've got another column called test score. This person got 78% on something. Um, so it's kind of like a dual view of, uh, of the way we chose to model our data. So what this gave us, uh, well, our implementation allowed us to add rows and columns. So we didn't have to pre-allocate anything because it was sparse. You can just start recording things at new rows and new columns uh, and new timestamps. So certainly it was very flexible. Um, uh, every value has a timestamp, so you know had a very strong notion of time, certainly met that requirement. Uh, our data structures are doubly indexed, so they're indexed by column and indexed by row. It allows us to do transpose, it allows us to do join, it allows us to do lookups, range lookups. Um, so that was good. 
Uh, and because we're you know, explicitly representing everything as a matrix, matrix operations are easy and efficient. Um, and this specifically enabled us to get sort of world-beating uh, SVD performance. So we have one of the fastest singular value decomposition implementations that we found, certainly. Um, and uh, we talked that up to a close match between the way that our data structures have been engineered and the way that our algorithm uh, has been built so as to match up closely together and, and, and take as much advantage of the physical hardware as possible. In terms of implementation, um, our data model exploits redundancy in a typical data set. Most real-world data sets have a shocking amount of redundancy in them uh, to get fairly extreme levels of compression. So per timestamp data point, including the value of the data point, we can get down to around two bytes per data point because there's often a lot of redundancy. So all we need to do is store sort of a couple indexes, look up into a big hash um, in order to, to, to store data points. So on, on real-world data sets, sort of user behavioral data sets, two to four bytes per data point. That means that on a, on a sort of 250 gigabyte machine, uh, in terms of RAM, we can store between one and two billion data points. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, you know, if you have a hundred million row matrix, you can have as many columns as you like, so long as on average only about 150 of them have a value in them, that's the amount of, of data you can store in RAM. So there aren't that many hundred million user websites out there. If you want to store, if you want to do machine learning on user behavior, you can have 150 distinct user behaviors for a uh, hundred million users in RAM. And for reference, to run a machine that has 244 gigabytes of RAM for one hour on Amazon costs about a dollar. So, you know, uh, in, in terms of in terms of, of dollar efficiency, it's it's pretty good. So, that's basically the data structure we had, uh, we we developed. Um, this is about a year ago. So, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, if you store the same amount of data in Postgres, with yep. kind of the same like schema you outlined, with like the timestamp row column, how much space would it take? Uh, um, yes, we. I don't have direct comparisons, but we certainly we had a 250 gigabyte machine upstairs, and uh, it only stored about like a year worth of data for us. Um, I guess that doesn't really answer your question. Uh, I can get back to you with a specific comparison, but it's uh, it's definitely nowhere near nowhere near this. Um, so uh, about a year ago, we had the data model sort of figured out. We we're using it in our products, uh, but we wanted to generalize. Uh, our software so as to make it accessible to people outside of Datacratic for, uh, to solve other problems than the one we were working on. So we needed a kind of high-level data access API. The one we had was essentially a C++ API. Um, so we basically looked around and decided that SQL is kind of the old school cool. A lot of people know SQL. It's, uh, it's well specified. People know sort of what it, what it does. Uh, it's an extremely expressive language. SQL, you just sort of tell the computer what you want, and the computer sort of sorts it out for you. And uh, the best part of that is that because the computer is sorting it out for you, you can write a bunch of code um, in SQL, and then someone optimizes the engine, and then your code your code runs faster. You don't need to kind of like rewrite your code to optimize it if if you if you do things right. So this able, enables us to have a nice decomposition of Datacratic, where we have data scientists and sort of high level language people uh, like me who can write SQL, and then you have uh, low level uh, C++ people who are able to optimize uh, our code, and so it works well as a team. Um, so MLDB has a fairly complete SQL select implementation. Uh, including joins, <laughs> um, which basically treats our 3D sparse matrix, uh, matrix data sets uh, as tables. So you won't hear me say the word table uh, because we felt that was too confusing. Our data sets are, uh, are three-dimensional, um, so you can do selects uh, on data sets. So because our data sets are these 3D sparse matrices, we had to uh, add a number of extensions to SQL because SQL wasn't quite powerful enough to do what we needed to do. So for one, because our data sets can have millions of columns, um, you know, sort of when you do a select and you have to enumerate the column, when we have a million of them and you don't know ahead of time what, the, what they all are, that's kind of a pain. So you can do something like select A star, which is uh, all of the columns that start with A, whose name starts with A, uh, excluding some expression like AB, uh, and then you can sort of dynamically rename them as C star from X. So that's sort of on the selection level, allows you to uh, address your, um, your columns. Um, we had to add explicit support for the time dimension uh, in our SQL implementation. So just like uh, when you do a, in, in an SQL expression, select tells you which columns to select, where tells you which rows to select. We added a when clause to tell you which time range to select because time is a sort of first class citizen uh, in, in an MLDB data set. So you can say select star from X when timestamp of A is less than timestamp of B. So if you're storing uh, user behavior in rows, you can basically say, uh, give me all the users who did, some, who did A before they did B. Uh, that's, then that's very powerful, sort of based directly into the language. Um, you can do some fancy row operations. So because we treat everything as a matrix, um, when you, you can do sum, which is basically a column-wise sum. We, have, we added horizontal sums, so you could do uh, uh, row-wise sum. 
and there's a horizontal sum for all the rows that uh, whose name starts with A. And you can also tokenize text because uh, unlike normal SQL, you don't have to know ahead of time when you're either parsing or executing or writing the query uh, how many columns it's going to have. So here you can say tokenize text from X. If you had a column called text, which had a bunch of text in it, tokenize it by default, I think, works with space. Um, you would end up with one column per word in your, uh, in your say, email or something like that. And that enables you to very, very quickly create a matrix which represents a bag of words, uh, which is excellent for feeding into an SVD and doing machine learning on the output. And then finally, we have some really fancy aggregates. Like, we essentially have a pivot table implementation <coughs> directly in SQL, uh, which you can use to, to, if you have a data set which represents, say, the movie lens data set, which is uh, user ID, movie ID, and a rating, you can select pivot movie ID rating from X group by user ID, and what, what that gives you is a giant matrix with user IDs down the, down the side, movie IDs across the top, and a sparse rating data set in the middle, which is basically the input you need uh, to build a movie recommender. So that basically covers uh, our data model and the SQL implementation that we have. Um, because is, you know, we're kind of building a modern database, we want it to be super easy to, uh, to connect to and super easy to deploy. So MLDB is distributed as a Docker image. Uh, if you go to mldb.ai right now, you can sort of you got Docker set up and Docker run a couple of special uh, parameters and it'll just download and start running. Um, a Docker image, if you haven't played with it too much, is a little bit like a lightweight virtual machine. So you don't have to have a whole separate kernel. It's like a virtual machine that shares your kernel. So I've been led to do. Um, you, you launch MLDB with a Docker run command and up comes the REST API and that's it. You don't need to have a special binding. You don't need to have a special library. It's not ODBC or JDBC or anything like that. Um, you know, super modern, web native. You can access it from any language. You can access it from the shell if you want. You can play with Bash and Curl um, and, and play with MLDB. Um, if I have a data set that's already been created called X, I can post some rows to it. I'm going to post one row here. Row name is hello, and the columns are uh, column name C, value is world, and I'm going to give it a random timestamp here because every value is timestamps. And if I want to do a query, I just do get slash query question mark, and then here I go Q equals my SQL, well, select hello from X. And here's my result set in JSON. So this is basically how you talk to MLDB, uh, just like a, a modern database should be. Questions so far? Pace is good. So I started out with basically this, this little bit of pseudocode to show you uh, what machine learning is. So now I'm going to show you how to do machine learning with MLDB. So uh, refresher from like 22 minutes ago. Uh, you create a training object, you use that, you run that on some historical data, you get some parameters, you get a predictor, you get predictions, outcomes, and you store that. The way we model that in, uh, in MLDB, we sort of reuse the same terminology as a, as a classical database like Postgres. We've got procedures and functions. So for us, a procedure is something that acts on a data set and can either produce a data set or a file. So uh, in machine learning terms, if you have your historical data, your training set in a data set, you run a procedure on it to train a model. The output of a training procedure, that set of parameters, uh, essentially gets stored in a file. And then you can create a function, which is parameterized by that file, and that function is your predictor. And as soon as you create a function, just like in Postgres, uh, you, know, you can create a user-defined function. It's accessible from SQL, so you can run SQL queries. But in MLDB, it's also available immediately as a REST endpoint. So to train a model, you run a procedure, and bam, you have a REST endpoint that you can interrogate in real time, sort of on demand, and you can run SQL queries um, to get access to your predictions. So very concretely, this is what uh, a very short sort of snippet of a conversation with MLDB looks like. MLDB isn't programmed uh, in any programming language. It's, you, you interact with it via REST. REST is sort of an HTTP uh, abstraction. So these are all HTTP commands. So to, to train something, I get sort of put a procedure called myTrainer with some configuration. Uh, I post a run to that procedure. I actually have to run it, uh, which will create essentially a file somewhere, uh, say on S3, which cont contains my parameters. Then I create a function and called my predictor with the same parameter URL. And then here we go. I can actually interrogate my predictor. So basically, this is the API you get. It's get function slash my predictor slash application question mark input equals here you can give it an input and it will give you a score. It will actually run whatever machine learning model you've trained. Uh, and if at some later date you get some outcomes, you can append the rows to the historical data set so that when you do it again, you, uh, you have retrained on new data and your system is adapted. So this here is where I can kind of, you know, go full circle with my initial example. You know, I had my little cute example at the beginning, select what will happen from new data. Well, this is basically it. If you want to take your predictor that you've just trained um, and you want to run it over a whole pile of data, you want to score a whole bunch of users or rate a whole bunch of movies or make a whole bunch of recommendations or something, from SQL it's immediately available. And it's like I said a minute ago, it's also available as automatically as a REST endpoint 
for sort of uh, on-demand access. And MLDB will do somewhere between, so it'll, it'll do around 100,000 queries per second on a, on a beefy node for, for this, kind of, uh, this kind of REST endpoint. So where is the SQL in all this? Just to clarify, this is a question that came up when I did a run through of this presentation. Um, so you create functions and, proce and, and procedures and you, and you run procedures via REST calls. And these are all configured by JSON objects. The SQL is a uh, select implementation essentially is used to sort of explore and transform the data. And it also shows up in all the JSON configurations. So anywhere you need to configure something where you need to tell um, a procedure sort of what fields to use or what rows to use, you can use SQL. So if you want to tell the training system which rows to use for training, that's a where expression. You want to tell it how to combine data sets together to create features, that's a from expression, right? You can do a join. Uh, if, you want to do, if you want to tell the system which columns of a data set to use as features for a machine learning model, uh, that's a select expression. So SQL is sort of pervasive throughout the elements of the JSON uh, configuration logs. And if we have time for the demo at the end, um, I'd be happy to show, show you all of that. So question I get all the time about MLDB is sort of, what algos you got. Um, so we have very efficient multi-threaded implementations of a whole pile of stuff, I'll go over it briefly. So for classifiers, we got all the basics. We got uh, generalized linear models, decision trees. Uh, as of recently, we have uh, support vector machines. We've got shallow neural nets. I don't know if that's a thing. Uh, K-nearest neighbors, naive bays. Um, we have ensemble methods, so you can do bagging or boosting on any of these, which means you can do uh, bag generalized linear models. You can do bag boosted decision trees very similar to random forest, you can do boosted dumps. Um, we have a calibration system, so you can turn the raw score that comes out of a typical machine learning model into an actual uh, proper probability from zero to one. Uh, we have a, a pretty unique feature uh, that gives you uh, insight into what the model is doing, so we can basically compute the feature importance of any given feature for any given model on any given data set for all classifiers, including ensembles. So this is not just looking at the weights of a generalized linear model. We can actually tell you how important a feature is for a random forest. Um, Sort of super useful, and I don't think I've seen that in any other machine learning package. Uh, for clustering, we got k-means. For dimensionality reduction, we have an extremely fast implementation of a singular value decomposition. Uh, for visualization, we have a very fast and efficient implementation of TSNE, much more scalable than the one in Scikit-Learn, which is excellent. Uh, and then for feature extraction, we've got a sort of grab bag of features. You can do bag of words, tokenization. We've got stop lists for NLP. Uh, you can do word to vec uh, embedding. We have feature hashing. Um, and we got statistics tables for sort of deriving counts from, uh, from bucketed features. So after telling you a little bit about sort of what MLDB's uh, API looks like, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you can think of building an application with MLDB. So if you wanted to build, a, let's say, a recommender for your website, you know, you're, you're, you work for a company that has a website, you've got a bunch of products, people buy products, or people rate products, let's say. Um, here's basically how it would look from a sort of logical boxes and arrows kind of view. Your website is up here, your users using your website um, is, and is, uh, is rating things. Your website basically just does HTTP post uh, calls to MLDB, which is inside the started uh, box, uh, and stores this data uh, in a data set. So you essentially have a data collection web service, right? That's what that slash data sets endpoint was. Um, so you're accumulating data there. Uh, however often you want to, you execute a procedure, which, which will train a model, and that model gets deployed as a function. And like we saw, a function immediately exposes a REST endpoint. So you have a recommender web service. So this is the way in which your website will interact with MLDB. It will actually query the recommender web service for recommendations. And you know, if your recommendations are any good, actually pretty much if they're bad too, um, you know, your user will follow your recommendations and then actually maybe rate the, the movie or whatever um, and allow you to learn. So if you've made bad recommendations, hopefully that will be back. If you've made good recommendations, um, your, your model can actually learn that it's done a good job. So at a logical level, this is kind of how you get the machine learning loop running. At a physical level, um, uh, one thing which I haven't addressed is sort of the persistence model for, for MLDB, and as you can see in the middle here, the persistence model is essentially shared storage. So MLDB delegates the responsibility for, per, per, for persistence to whatever shared storage uh, you have configured it for, and that's on a data set by data set uh, basis. So if you choose to use S3, congratulations, you have an infinite disk with however many nines Amazon is promising you this week. Uh, if you're using HDFS, you have whatever it is that your HDFS team provides for you. Um, so the way that this would look like, essentially, data collection service, it's a web service, you throw a load balancer on there, you have however many nodes of MLDB you, you wish to run for data collection, and they're all persisting your data uh, in shared storage. Uh, for training, you have a, essentially a pool or a grid of uh, training nodes, however big you want to pay for, uh, that will do your training and store the, the resulting model um, specification files 
in your shared storage, which are then loaded by your scoring tier, however many uh, nodes you need to support the load of whatever application you have, just behind a load balancer. So on a physical level, this is kind of how it goes. Um, and then, 30 minutes. Um, and then uh, any data scientists you have on your team who want to load this uh, locally can sort of spin up however many nodes you want. Yes? How is the data stored in S3? The data is stored in this proprietary materialized 3D sparse matrix. Make sense? No? Okay, so each node will essentially uh, memory map a file locally, and whenever it, it, uh, its internal timer tells it to go store uh, the, the data on S3, it will transfer it via S3's HTTP interface uh, over to S3. So the data collection essentially will just do that. But the, the, uh, I interpreted your question to me what format it was, so it's in whatever, in, in this uh, proprietary format. Although I should add that MLDB supports sort of pluggable formats, so if you don't want to use a proprietary backend, you can store it in something less efficient like CSV or something like that if you like as well. Sorry, are you leveraging HGFS somehow if you store it on HGFS? We're just using it to store. Just to store, okay. Yeah. So now for sort of the question that kills, uh, you know, this is big data Montreal, how big? How does it scale? Uh, so I'm gonna answer that question in three parts. Uh, part number one, uh, how does sort of the, uh, what's the time and cost trade-off uh, as compared to the size of the training set? So here, um, you know, we, uh, when we, when MLDB sort of first hit uh, Hacker News, someone came and reached out to us and said, hey, so, hey we have a, I have a benchmark that I run on a whole bunch of machine learning tools. Would you like to uh, submit a benchmark for MLDB? So we did, it's available right here. Uh, the basic results are for a random forest benchmark on a million uh, example uh, data set. MLDB is the fastest of any of the libraries that have been benchmarked. It's 50% faster than XGBoost. Uh, it's 10 times faster than Spark. It's 10 times faster than Scikit-Learn. Uh, it's five times faster than H2O on the same machine. This is an R3 8x large AWS instance. Um, if you wanted to do an SVD, a singular value decomposition, on a two gigabyte uh, sparse matrix, which is basically like late, late, latent semantic analysis, uh, we run 20 times faster and 100 times cheaper than Spark. So the, the basis for that claim is that uh, we can do this SVD in one minute on one machine, uh, whereas a Spark cluster of eight equivalent machines takes 17 minutes to do it. So in terms of the raw sort of machine minutes takes, it takes to do, to do the SVD, uh, 100, 100 times cost advantage. In terms of scalability on the size of the training set, MLDB does all of its training on a single node at a time. So uh, the size of the training set is limited by RAM. My next slide is devoted to addressing this, so let me, let me get back to that. Uh, and in terms of the speed of scoring, MLDB can execute models, depending on the kind of model you're doing and sort of how you're connecting to it, at approximately 100 kqps uh, per node, depending on the details. Uh, there. So um, I didn't hear quite a, uh, as much of a gasp as I thought I might, but you know, no distributed training, really. Um, so essentially, the return on investment for uh, distributed machine learning training is disastrous as compared to sampling uh, or using more RAM. So let me, let me kind of unpack that. Um, if, you, if you assume that you have like a really nice scalable system that takes twice as many computers to process uh, twice as big a data set, right? Essentially to double the size of your, of your training set, you're spending twice as much money. Most curves that I have ever seen for the, the, the increase in performance for, compared to the size of a training set, this is, a, uh, this is a log scale by the way, are not linear. So doubling the size of your training set nowhere near doubles the performance that you're getting out of your machine learning model. So if your machines are scaling linearly with your training set and your costs are scaling linearly with your machines and your performance improvement is not scaling linearly with your machines, then you know, the more money you spend, the more money you're wasting, essentially, because you're not making much more money for your investment. Um, so essentially, distributed training is not something that for most real world problems we see an, a, as a necessity. The nice thing about this kind of curve, however, it means that if you're actually training on, say, something that's a half or a third or a tenth of your data, you're also not losing all that much performance. So uh, if you have a fixed amount of RAM, just sort of sample it down until it fits in RAM. Train it that way. And if you can actually build a serious business case for using uh, distributed training uh, on, on this kind of problem, then, then please come talk to us. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing you can do is you can just get more RAM, right? So today, the best kind of machine you can get, as far as we're concerned, is a R3 8x large. It's got 244 gigs of RAM, which sounded like a lot, you know, last year. Um, but next year, Amazon is releasing the X series, which is two terabytes of RAM, right? So when I said you can store between one and two billion data points uh, on the biggest machine on Amazon, uh, well, soon you'll be able to score to store, you know, between 16 and 32 billion data points uh, on, on a single machine. So, um, you know. 
yes, we don't do distributed, I guess, no, we don't do distributed training, but we don't see that as a, as a drawback. We see that as a massive ROI advantage. Um, so this, this guy, I don't really know who it is, but Gary Bernhardt kind of tweeted a little sarcastically, you know, consulting service, you bring your data big problems to me. I say, your data fits in RAM, and then you pay me $10,000 for having saved you $500,000. So it's probably a little sarcastic for a lot of big data problems. There are situations in which distributed computing makes a lot of sense. If you have a lot of things that need to be counted, that's a trivially parallelizable problem. You go, you, you Hadoop the snot out of that thing, right? Um, machine learning is not that kind of problem. In order to do, uh, to, to, to get a lot of performance out of machine learning, you need to capture the interactions between different data points, which means you can't just sort of split your data, stick it on different nodes and, and hope for the best. Uh, I've linked to a nice blog post here, uh, which basically kind of does a survey of a bunch of different uh, machine learning experts all, all kind of concluding the same thing, that distributed machine learning is not really, not really very worth it. In fact, we've got John Langford, the author of uh, Valpo Wabbit, who kind of actually show, uh, explains why sometimes when you actually distribute a computation, it costs more because you've distributed it. Uh, it's not much faster, and sometimes it's even slower. And depending on the algorithm you, you've used, you actually get worse performance than if you just waited a little longer because of the way you've sharded your data and, uh, and are recombining the weights afterwards, uh, the different learners on the different nodes haven't all seen the same amount of data, so you're actually losing performance. So, you know, sometimes you say, like, faster, cheaper, better, pick two. Well, with distributed machine learning training, it kind of seems like faster, cheaper, better, pick none. <laughs> right? <laughs> doesn't seem very good. Um, so that's kind of the scaling story uh, for MLDB. Um, and that basically wraps up my presentation. Um, I feel like we've got time for a demo. Uh, let me just run through the slide. I'll take questions, and I'll do a demo. Does that sound good? So uh, open source release is coming soon. I glossed over the license because no one asked me. Um, but uh, today we have essentially a non-commercial free trial of MLDB that you can run. It's distributed as a, as a big binary Docker image. Um, we will be open sourcing the core of MLDB. And our business model is basically to sell high-performance plugins, um, notably the sparse uh, 3D matrix storage engine. Um, but you can trial all the features right now for free at mldb.ai. We've got some cool demos. I uh, would love your feedback. All the feedback goes to me and uh, the members of my team who are here, um, and we will answer you and help you help you use it. You're in Montreal. We're in Montreal. Let, let's uh, let's work together. Um, it runs on Linux with Docker. It runs on uh, AWS. We've got a prepackaged AMI, so you don't even need to do anything. You just sort of click, give uh, Amazon your credit card details, and hit go. Um, we don't we don't see a dime, unfortunately. We're working on that. Um, we've got a virtual machine that you can run on VirtualBox on your Mac or Windows. You won't have as many cores, you won't have as much RAM, but you can still use MLDB. Um, and then uh, just because it's a question I get all the time, how do I get started? Well, you can load your data either from a file, like a CSV, uh, like I'm going to do in the demo in a second, or uh, you can sort of row by row uh, with HTTP, HTTP post, much like the way uh, with SQL you would sort of do repeated inserts to get your data. So loading it from a file is a little bit like a copy command um, in the traditional database, and row by row posts are a little bit like insert commands in the traditional database. So I would be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Uh, so in your, in your data format, you have a timestamp, right? Is that necessary? Like, why might it depend on timestamps? Uh, it is necessary. If you give the same timestamp to all of your um, to all of your values, then uh, it takes very, very few bits to represent that. So there's a little bit of overhead, uh, but, but not a whole lot. And, and yes, it is necessary. That's sort of the, the nature of the beast. Um, in practice, in most production applications, we find the timestamp usually comes up, even if you choose not to model it in the beginning. Um, it's very useful, at the very least, to as you're getting new data, to sort of record the date that you got it or something, so you're not biasing things. But you can basically the short answer is you set, set it to zero, and it will be modeled as you know January first, uh, 1970. Question over here. Yep. Yes. Uh, why did you look for uh, participants in the versus non Like I saw it like in the in the slide in the beginning, you were looking for like uh, rigid versus not rigid. So we, we were looking for a flexible schema. Yeah, why is that? Um, so for example, the, the, the way that we build the matrices that go into most of our, uh, most of our machine learning algorithms, um, you essentially end up having one column per, I don't know what to call it, per element or per, per, uh, per value. And you essentially represent things as a, as a big uh, sparse matrix. So for example, if you want to think of your matrix being uh, each row is a user and each column is a movie, well, if you have a fixed schema, then you can't add movies. A new movie comes out, there's just you can't, you can't represent that movie. So having a flexible schema and having sort of being able to add columns on the fly to your, to your matrix is very, very important. That's one of the biggest limitations for using um, something like, like uh, SciPy or scikit-learn is when you create um, 
an ND array is very hard to resize it. You can't just sort of stick a column on the end. You lose all the all the uh, all the events. Does that make sense? So, so you, for, when you do when you, have, you don't have this, this value. I'm sorry. What and what, what if you get like you you're processing the old value and you don't have like the result for the next one? Just ignore it and for the story. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, you mean what if we, what if we don't have outcomes for any of the new values? In general, we wouldn't do training on 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 data that doesn't have an outcome associated, so it would not go into the training system. And you could use the SQL expression to filter that out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Francis. J'ai deux questions. Je suis pas sûr de comprendre le license model. I mean, if I'm using it to play, and it's free, but let's say I want to put this in production for one of my clients. How does that work? And the second one is. You know, in Python, there's pandas, which is optimal for time series. So, have you explored that to basically store your data? And I mean, what's sure, the so name? Yeah. On the license, um, when you download it, when you download MLDB to play with it, you uh, you are required to sort of check through the end user license agreement, which prom which makes you promise that you're not going to use it to make any money. Okay. Um, so, you're contractually bound with us to to not make any money with the trial version. And if you would like to buy a license from us, we will happily sell you one. Um, is, but, is but the short the answer. basis of the license model, like to get a big picture? Because I mean, if I want to use it, I, I need to know. So what, what what's the pricing scheme like? Yeah. So the pricing scheme is essentially, um, first of all, we're we're sort of you know looking for looking for customers for this product. So we're more than happy to discuss a pricing scheme which will work for you. Okay. Uh, the basic hypothesis we have is that we're either going to price it on a per core, per machine, or per query basis, whatever makes sense for you. So we don't want to find something that doesn't make sense for your business model. Um, okay. We we need to find something that works for both of us. Uh, so the, you know the answer is sort of call sales, and we'll we'll talk to you. Um, <laughs> uh, with respect to pandas, um, I mean pandas essentially uh, holds all your data in RAM on the node, um, a little bit like MLDB, but doesn't have a sort. It's not memory mapped to uh, to a persisted storage, um, and it's not sort of running on a separate process somewhere. So um, pandas is not particularly good for dealing with uh, the types of data that that we work with. Um, I'm trying to answer. I, I guess I haven't found it to be that great for time series data uh, in, in general, and certainly not very good for sparse data. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to store a million column uh, sparse pandas data frame. It just sort of tips yeah. over after a while. That's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, is it going to be easy in the open source release to edit that model? Um, Short answer is no. If that's something that's important to you, I'd really be interested in, in discussing it. Right now, the model uh, the models are uh, essentially serialized binary, so they're, they're they're fairly opaque. You can you can uh, you can deserialize them and reserialize them as JSON to inspect them, but we don't have a write through. You can't like go edit the weights, so it'll get stored as binary because it's efficient, and you can you can kind of inspect it. You can get it out as JSON, but you can't edit back in. Uh, but if you'd like to do that, I mean the model generation. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean like the code to make. The Oh, uh, that's already open source. Uh, it's it's uh, JML, so uh, github.com slash datacardic slash JML. You can go look at it. Yep. I have a question to better understand. Like, uh, what's the uh, best use case for this? Or maybe to rephrase, uh, is there a use case that you optimize it for? Um, a specific use case within machine learning? or? Yeah. Um, so this this is the technology that we run inside our real-time bidding optimization audience uh, modeling product. So advertising is a little bit domain specific. What it's it's very optimal for essentially sparse data sets. It turns out that user behavioral data sets are very sparse. So if you have a bunch of web pages and a bunch of users, most users don't visit most web pages. Uh, so that data set tends to be sparse. So if you want to do recommendations of things for which you have uh, sparse data, it's very good. Uh, a lot of text analysis problems tend to basically be represented as sparse matrices of bags of words, so it's very, very good for that. Um, and uh, predicting user behavior, like in, like in advertising, uh, is a good example. Um, you know, fraud detection, Internet of Things sort of data coming in from devices, any kind of event log data that you want to do predictions on, MLDB uh, is a very good fit for. Yep. Um, so, as someone that uses R a lot, Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely recognize myself in that thing you said about spending a lot of time cleaning the data. And, but at the same time, R is very flexible as well. Right? Like the data frame, data table structure of R, I, mean, it, I don't, like your thing seems very flexible in terms of uh, schema, but R, I could probably beat that. 
So my comment would be, this seems very interesting, but did you think of, uh, you know, you, you said your product basically allows you to train models and then send them to production and kind of use them right away, which is great. But if there was an option just for me as a data scientist used to R, where I could train a model with packages I already know, and then just take that output, the parameters, and feed them to your API. Sure. Um, so that's something that we, we have on our roadmap. It's not that high on, on the list at the moment, partly because um, essentially training within the MLDB system is so much faster than training it in R, and will scale way beyond what you can do in R. Um, because we, we can essentially address way more memory, um, and we represent things a little bit better than the way uh, R does it uh, in memory. So for the scale of problems that, that we deal with, when you're, uh, you know, when you have a 250 gig sparse matrix, I mean, you just can't do that in R. Um, if you want to run an SVD on, on that, I, I haven't been able to do it. Uh, R will just crash for me. Maybe I don't know how to use it. But, um, so that, so essentially, like that, that's essentially uh, using MLDB scoring engine. To, to operate on models which have been trained on a much smaller amount of data than it's, than it's been sort of queued for. But certainly it's something that would be interesting, uh, interesting to look at. Is there some use case for, I mean, NLDB is not, I mean, is not great in machine learning. Is there one specific case like you, you won't recommend using? Sure. Um, happy to talk about the weaknesses of my product. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, uh, the sparse 3D matrix structure um, is, is very good for sparse data, it's very bad for, for continuous dense data. So if you try and stick images in there, um, you will be sad and I will be sad um, because it won't work very well for you. Now that said, the way that MLDB has been engineered, um, the storage engine backends are pluggable. So today we have a very high performance sparse representation. Um, we, we certainly, there's no reason why we can't build a dense representation to go back and meet the same API because essentially representing things as, you know, stacked, stacked matrices, right? sort of timestamp matrices. So if you wanted to inefficiently represent video, you could just sort of you know, serialize all the frames as part of this matrix and have a timestamp, or you could have uh, images be columns or be rows or something like that. So today we don't have a very efficient storage for that. It turns out, turns out that there are many uh, efficient ways to do that already, and we might be able to reuse one or, or plug it in. Certainly that's the biggest uh, weakness of MLDB right now. It's not very good for um, audio data, video data, uh, image data and generalized sort of dense time series data. So if you have some sort of sensor which is giving you like a data point every microsecond or something like that, um, conceptually you could represent it as a long string uh, in a single value at a single time time point, but you will lose a lot of the performance of MLDB for that. It'll work, it'll just be slow. Okay. Yep. As for the image data, would you recommend like for example scratch them and then put in the data? The We're working on a neat trick which is basically to take something like uh, ImageNet sort of top off the top, uh, the classification part, and use ImageNet to generate, uh, to, gener to essentially embed images in a, in, a, in a space. So to compress images down from however many you know, megapixels they are down to a, a much smaller vector, uh, and then do machine learning on that. Much like you could, uh, we already have support for, for word to vec so if you have a document, you can, you can embed that in a, in a smaller space. So we'll probably uh, build a similar plugin for MLDB that allows you to do that trick on images and essentially dodge the cursive dimensionality by using uh, deep, uh, a deep net that someone else has trained and, and sort of given away for free. Do you have a, like a, a deadline for that? Uh, not, not particularly, but if you are interested in that, come talk to me and we can talk. Okay. Um, it's, not, it's not that difficult, but uh, it's just not, not something that we've, uh, we've put a lot of effort in because it's not something we're hearing from our customers, but if you would like to become one of our customers, we'd be happy to prioritize that for you. Yep. Is there a simple Sorry, one second. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm trying to, so if I understood correctly, the main requirement is that your data, data set feeds some RAM, right? Um, that a, a sufficiently representative subsample of your data set fits into RAM. Ah. So let's say a hypothetical example that I have two huge online stores, sure. and each of them has its own user base, and I want to have basically a recommendation engine for each of them. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that uh, it's all stored in, let's say, in S3 and only accessed when needed, when, let's say, I want to do some calculations for store one and then later on for store two? Yes. It means that only the data for store one needs to be in the memory at the given point in time. Yes. So that means that anything that is stored is kind of swapped out and I can use it later on. Exactly. Okay. In fact, we, we're even a little bit more brutal than that. We just kill the machine. So we turn on, we turn on a machine, we spin up an AMI, have it load the data it needs, 
run the training and then shut it down. We don't even swap it out and we don't bother. We ah, just okay. turn it off and turn on another machine some other day. But essentially that's uh, yeah. the, the same thing, right? Exactly. So you can you can actually store way more data in MLDB. I mean, in MLDB, MLDB is sort of the the the, the it passes through MLDB to the underlying store, and S3 is essentially an infinite disk. Disk. So, how much data can you store in there? Well, how much data are you willing to pay Amazon for? Uh, then you load up some subset of that into memory to do training. Whatever subset it is that you're loading for training must fit into the RAM of whatever node you're using. So, if you own your own servers and you have a four terabyte server. Uh, and you have the HDFS behind it to, to store the data, that's awesome. On Amazon today, it's going to be 250 gigs, and next year it'll be 2 terabytes. So that also implies that uh, the more data sets I want to query concurrently, the more I have to pay, basically, for an MLDB license. That, that does seem to follow, yes. Okay. Surprisingly for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of IPython notebook yep. to do beta exploration. So is there a way of using that? Yep. So um, if you guys are still with me and you want to you want to see a demo, I'm I'm happy to show you. Yeah. You guys are up for the demo? Okay. I will answer your question with a demo. Thanks. Thank you. Not a planted question, I promise. Um, so is this up? Please be up. Okay. So MLDB doesn't have a UI per se. This is basically the only UI you get, and it mostly just allows you to, to list the data sets, procedures, and functions. So when you first connect to MLDB, this is what you get. It's running on the famous uh, R38X large. Uh, within MLDB, because it's a, essentially a Docker image which has a bunch of stuff inside it and exposes a REST uh, uh, API, we've reserved uh, part of the address space for uh, IPython Notebook. So IPython Notebook comes with MLDB. You don't need to learn how to install it. You don't need to mess with it. Uh, we stuck our own logo in the corner, but I mean, it's Jupyter. Uh, the demo I'm going to show you um, it's not going to be a particularly big data demo just because uh, those are boring to watch. Uh, fast as MLDB is, you know, that's just kind of how it is. Um, so the demo I'm going to show you uh, is the rather well-known uh, Titanic Survival Prediction Challenge from Kaggle, who here has, is aware of this uh, classification task. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, there was a Titanic, it ran into an iceberg. Some of the people who were on the boat died. Um, the idea is to take a data set which lists a whole bunch of those uh, of the passengers of the Titanic and some information about them, and we have uh, information about who, who survived and who didn't, and uh, we have to train a model to looking only at the features uh, that were known when they got on board um, what, to predict whether or not they would have survived the disaster. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't make this up. This is kind of a... Um, is that good? Okay, so... Um, this is uh, IPython Notebook. Who here has worked with Jupyter or IPython Notebook before? Okay, so every little gray box here contains some code. I've already executed the whole thing, so I'm just gonna sort of scroll through, but this is all Python code. Um, I'll put a big uh, asterisk here. Uh, you don't have to use Python to use MLDB. I just happen to have used this because it's easy to package. You can talk to MLDB from R, from the shell, from whatever you want. Um, so I'm loading up uh, this uh, handy Python library that we did write called PyMLDB, which is a very thin wrapper around the Python request library. So it's just a way to make HTTP calls and display the JSON output in a nice way. There's no magic under the hood. You can do this all without PyMLDB if you want. So the Titanic data set, this is basically what it looks like to load a data set into MLDB. Um, this is the way it's been specified in Python, but ultimately all I did was I did a put on uh, the data set's endpoint. I put a data set called Titanic raw, and I told it it was gonna be a CSV file and it should get it from this URL. Um, so that's what it did. And it didn't skip any lines due to problems, and it loaded 891 lines, and it was reasonably quick. So looking at the data, um, this is basically how you do a query. MLDB.query, select like star from Titanic Royal Limit 5. Should be pretty familiar to anybody who speaks SQL. Uh, the output of this query call from PyMLDB conveniently is a pandas data frame. So it just displays right away because IPython notebook will display the pandas data frame. So there's a little bit of magic under the hood, but it looks like you, know, you query it and it displays it for you. Um, Open source is awesome. So here we've got, uh, for each row here as a passenger, we've got the age, the cabin number, uh, not for everyone, obviously, uh, the, their port of embarkation, because the Titanic stopped a couple times before it ran into an iceberg, um, how much they paid for their ticket, uh, their name, uh, some kind of cryptic stuff like parch, which is the number of parents or children that was with the passenger. Uh, P class is their passenger class, so first class, second class, third class. Uh, sex, sibspa, which is uh, whether they had any spouses or siblings with them, uh, their ticket number, and the label, which is whether or not they survived. So um, 
MLDB allows you to sort of train and test classifiers in separate steps, but training and testing a classifier is something that people do frequently enough that we have a special experiment system for that. So we're basically going to run an experiment uh, on this data set. And this is basically the JSON blob that we're going to use uh, to configure our classifier. So we're going to create a procedure. Its type will be classifier.experiment. Um, and its parameters, its name will be Titanic. Um, keep artifacts true, meaning uh, all of the data sets, all of the, the, all of the accuracy data sets which are created as part of running this uh, experiment shall be persisted, shall be kept. The training data set will be Titanic raw. The model file URL, which is well, this, uh, the, the file which contains the parameters of the model uh, will be here uh, in, in local, uh, on the local file system. Uh, algorithm BBDT. So I'm going to use one of the pre-canned, uh, pre-configured bag boosted decision trees. Instead of algorithm, you can put configuration and you can put a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of JSON uh, parameters that you can set depending on the nature of the algorithm what you want to use. You want to make an ensemble of boosted decision trees and bag GLZ, you can do that. This is just for the purposes of demo, I've, I've, I've used a pre-canned one. Um, in terms of, uh, here it says select. So these are the features that I'm going to use. And this is an SQL expression. It's just a list of features, but it's an SQL expression which will be used to select the features from the, uh, from the data set. Label is label, um, and here we go. So I'm gonna run it, uh, and it ran, and uh, I just printed the area under the curve, which is not exactly world beating, but you know, this is a, a quick demo with no tuning. Uh, the area under the curve was 0.84. So you can see that we automatically got a REST API for predictions, um, and in fact, what I can do here is, uh, using the magic of my Python notebook, I've, I can build a little UI here that lets me play with a hypothetical passenger. So I have a pa hypothetical passenger uh, where you know the, the parameters are here, so 40 years old, paid $50, which is a lot, uh, four children slash parents with them. Uh, and what I can do, here's, here's basically the, the call that was made to the API and the actual score. And then as I'm uh, moving back and forth here, uh, there's a little bit of lag because this is running through an SSH tunnel, but you can see that, I think you can see it, can you see it? No, fair. You can see here that the fair is changing right down here, and the score is changing, and so basically I'm, I'm querying my API here in real time. So as I'm moving my little slider, I'm making repeated HTTP calls, um, and I'm changing the, the, the prediction is changing. So that's, you know, I mean, it's a little boring, but that's uh, training a model and getting, a, getting an API out of it. Um, so you'll notice here that the output of my, of my machine learning model is some sort of score here, negative 3.7. So it's clearly not a probability, at the very least, because it's negative. So this is pretty typical of, uh, of a decision tree or something like that, is you'll get a numerical score which is sort of rank ordered, but uh, it's hard to interpret as a, as a probability. So the way you, you tend to make a binary classifier, did someone survive or not, is you sort of declare that any score above zero or whatever, um, you, they survived and any score below zero, they didn't. And the way you explore where to set that threshold is by drawing what's called a receiver operating characteristic curve. Um, I have a little bit of Python code here to do that. So here I've got a curve. So every point on this curve, corresponds to a trade-off between the false positive rate and the true positive rate that would uh, result from me setting the threshold there and declaring that everybody above the threshold has survived. And again, I can do a little kind of dynamic thing, whereas I can move around the threshold, you can see that my set point, this little green dot is moving, and as I'm moving my green dot around, you can see that I'm getting way more false positives. So I'm getting almost all true positives, very few false negatives, but at the cost of getting a lot of false positives. And so I can move this around and choose um, the trade-off that makes me happy. So you can see that as I'm reducing the false positives, this, you can't read it here, but false negatives is growing, and so I can kind of play with this until I get some, something that makes me happy. Um, and uh, you can ask yourself, you know, what is this model doing under the hood? I said we had a, a way of assigning feature importance to all of the features in a, in a bag boosted decision tree. So what I can do is I can create a function of type classifier.explain, and I point it at the model file. Um, and now I've got my, my explainer. Uh, and I can explore the impact of the features for a given example. So here, let me just make sure it works. Yep. OK, so basically, this is a graphical decomposition of, uh, of the score that this model has assigned to this hypothetical passenger. So for, for a passenger of sort of these parameters, um, what, the, score, what the, the model essentially does is um, it starts out with a, with a default sort of bias <coughs> score. And then every feature has a sort of con contribution to the score. So in this particular case, each is a slight negative contribution. Where they embark has a slight <coughs> negative contribution. The fare that they paid has a slight positive contribution, and so on and so forth. So the cumulative sum of all of these sort of um, contributions over here turns out to be the score. 
And so you can see this is exactly the same thing as I was doing before. As I play with fair up and down, you can see that it might be a little slow because it's on the network here. It doesn't change a whole lot, but a little bit. And not only that, but you can see that as I'm changing the fair, not only is this moving down, but age is moving down. So this isn't just a linear model where playing with one, the, the, the values of one feature only impacts that. It's essentially looking at the interaction for everything. So for this passenger, by varying fair around in the context of everything else, this is what's going on. So this person, you know, if you paid a dollar for your ticket and you were 48, uh, you, didn't, you didn't have a great chance of surviving. I've played with this enough to know that if you uh, were a younger girl, you have a much higher chance of surviving if you have no siblings with you. So already it's much, much higher. Um, and it turns out that um, this is for one hypothetical example, but this same, this same sort of explanation code can be run on the entire data set. And so what I can do now is I can sum up the explanation value to get the overall feature importance. So now what I've done here is I've, I've, uh, I've essentially run the explainer on the, training, uh, on the testing set with the labels. And so I'm summing up the contribution of every feature towards predicting, predicting the correct label. And so here you can see that the sex is, uh, is a, uh, the most important characteristics, uh, followed by age, fair, uh, their passenger class um, and how many siblings they had with them and because of the magic of SQL I'm pretty sure this still works I can do this I can say group by label um, and you can see now that the legend has disappeared just to prove to you guys this is not pre canon it's actually a live demo it's very dangerous for me uh, you can see that here uh, green will be the people who survived and blue will be the people who didn't survive and so you can see that the different features are contributing differently for the different classes. So sex is a very important feature for correcting, correctly predicting survival, slightly less important for correctly predicting uh, non-survival, um, but it, um, the number of parents and children they had with, uh, with them actually was not helpful for predicting survival, it was a little bit helpful for predicting uh, non-survival. Um, so this is kind of a bit of a demo of the, the insights feature that we have. Uh, and it works equally well with ensembles, linear models, decision trees. It can also be used, instead of splitting here by, by class, I can split by test versus train. So if you have a feature that's very helpful in training, and very unhelpful in testing, then you have a biased feature, and this will help you detect that graphically very, very quickly. Uh, not only that, but you can use this to build a sort of online checker. So you can uh, run this on your testing set and get a particular graph, and then as you're running new predictions through it, if it turns out that the importance that the model is assigning to your examples live um, as, you, as you're accumulating the outcomes, it's changing that you know that something has changed in your population such that your model no longer correctly represents it. Do you do that? Uh, we do not do that at the moment. But you could. <laughs> yep. Uh, Jeff, any benchmark regarding the training time of your data set? I mean, it's probably changing if your data set is larger. But yep, so the, the, the benchmark that I've got that. Our data plan, just a, a ballpark of how much time it can take. Uh, so for the for, for training a um, a hundred tree random forest with depth twenty on a hundred million categorical numerical examples on a thirty two core machine it takes twenty seconds. Now you gotta specify, right? But uh, so the benchmark that I, that I use, uh, I, I I I encourage you to, to check it here. It's um, does that work? Do you use Gartney cards? Uh, no. No, we don't. So here's basically, um, these are the results for some well-known open source libraries on this particular benchmark. Uh, so 200 seconds for, for Scikit-Learn, 130 for H2O, 30 for FGBoost, and 250 for Spark MLlib. Uh, the, same, the same problem, uh, MLDB benchmarks at 20 seconds. So it gives you a sort of relative order of magnitude. Um, and we scale, we scale uh, uh, very competitively with those. So we, we remain under the curve uh, as the scales to 10, 20, 30. 40 million. Um, Can you so. get into a situation where you cannot train your data set? Uh, sure. If it, stuff. So how do you? If it's too big, it will it will run out of memory. Uh, then then we recommend that you sample. Uh, and depending on the uh, relative uh, prevalence of the two classes, you can instead of sampling sort of absolutely randomly, you can sort of sample the most prevalent classes the most. So if you know that you have only one out of every million examples is a positive one, you can sort of, you know, take all of your positive examples and a, and a sufficiently uniform sample of your of your uh, negative examples, and then use the explain feature at the end to see whether or not you've biased um, by doing that. Yep. 
So great presentation about the high pass in the post. I'm just wondering, in the machine learning uh, community, like most of the people just talk about deep learning. So can I do it with MLDB? Um, MLDB does not have any feature for any features for deep, convolutional, or recurrent uh, neural networks. That said, um, we do have uh, support for uh, vector space embedding via the SVD. And we can leverage uh, models that other people have trained for us using deep learning techniques like word to vec and, uh, and eventually ImageNet for, uh, for images. Um, ultimately, uh, deep learning is a, it's fairly tricky. Uh, use, you know, it's fairly expensive. The ROI is doubtful. Um, may or may not require sort of specialized hardware, a vast amount of data, and an army of data scientists to, to use effectively. So um, we generally focus on sort of uh, smart feature engineering um, and, and using sort of simpler models like SVDs and, uh, and, and random forest for classification. Thanks. Uh, I'll be here until they kick me out. I've got stickers that say Datacratic on them if you guys want them. I've got some team members, um, and I'm happy to just demo more stuff until my voice runs out. So thank you very much for listening. I realize there's a lot of questions.